Philosophy Matters. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Good to see you. I'm excited today to be talking a little bit about some of my history with voluntarists and sharing some ideas about how you can avoid some of the mistakes I made when I was first developing the series and doing my fundraisers on Indiegogo and, you know, kind of getting the momentum building for the series. So I'm going to be going over some of those things and sharing with you what you can do to have a best kind of effort and pitch for your own series if you're working on that or considering it for the future. So uh, real quick, I'm going to uh, just remind everybody here that if you're seeing this and you're not on the YouTube, definitely go to youtube.com forward slash Jack Lloyd for the YouTube channel. That way I can see your comments best and also subscribe there. That's where you can get your notifications when new videos go live. So hit that notification bell as well. So that way you can see you next time, just like I see Liberty Prime here right now hanging on out. So I'm going to be uh, just going through that history here and sharing some of those uh, screenshots of, uh, or I should say uh, images of things I had been working on and talking through the different mistakes uh, I had made, you know, starting this from basically nothing. I, I really didn't have any uh, formal uh, specific education in terms of comic book making. I was just someone who had some skills in the, in the realm, had done a little bit in art school, but was not myself, you know, really trained to do comic book art. I wasn't in any type of uh, formal education for screenwriting or, you know, writing comic books or doing novels or anything like that. So I was just someone who had an interest in it and decided to to kind of teach themselves. And with that, of course, <laughs> uh, back in the day, there wasn't as much information about how to do that online. I had to actually learn a lot from scratch uh, because when I started doing this, you know, really in 2010 is when it started to kind of percolate and, and, and form about what I was trying to do and eventually launched that in 2012. There wasn't as much information as there is today online about how to do all this. There's a lot more out there today, but it's still not as quite exhaustive. And I'm probably going to add some more educational videos about that in the future. But there really just isn't like a specific, uh, I guess you could say one stop shop where it's like, oh, okay, you want to create your own comic book series? Well, here's what you could do to, you know, fundraise and how to do messaging and how to hire artists and all this other stuff. I had to do all that stuff uh, from scratch, te teach myself, learn from different resources. So uh, the first thing I'm going to bring up here, I'm going to grab my uh, screen here. So I'm going to be talking about. The first mistake that I had made when I when I made my uh, first issue, and that was having one artist do everything. So, normally with comic books, you don't have one person doing all elements of the art, and that was something I didn't fully realize the importance of right off the bat, and it's it's not something that's readily apparent to anybody either if they're not familiar with all the nuances of the industry and, and people's different talents and abilities. But the idea that you have one person competently do pencils, inks, colors, or color flatting, and then details, the lettering, and then formatting everything together, it is just very rare. And if someone can do all that, they're like basically an art god, essentially. If, you, if you're competent at all levels of that, you're one of the top artists in the world really you're you're absolutely you know one of the best if you can competently do all those elements so i didn't know that that was something you really should make sure to have different people do so when i first hired out i had an artist who i was having do all the elements now the car wasn't too bad but the you know you could see the real i guess you could say uh not not the best in terms of design the elements on on this page right here where in this first issue, you know, the uh, the way that the text is done and the, the speech bubbles is not exactly the best. It says, ah, I need to learn how to fight better. But it also is like, ah, I need to uh, have someone independently do the the actual lettering. So and, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's sad to say that 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 was something I didn't know at the time that, you know, you really need to get someone independently who specialized in that to do it. But you live and you learn and you get better. 
So, and as uh, Nathan Klein here says, specialization, and that's exactly right. You know, when it comes to anything in the market, specialization is key. You have people who are really homed in on a certain skill and they hone that skill over time and they become, you know, better than most at it. And so when it comes to doing the artwork, you really need specialists in every area. Some people can do maybe two things really well. So there's definitely more, it's more common that maybe you'll get someone who can do pencils and inks. Sometimes you get someone who can do pencils and colors, so, you know, that kind of thing. But the idea that you're gonna do pencils, inks, colors, letters, and then all the formatting, and you're gonna be great at all of it. Again, it's just, it's super rare. So when you're doing your own comic book series, you definitely want to hire out in separate elements. Typically, in my experience and how I do things these days, I have a primary penciler, and then I have someone else who does the inks and colors. So someone who's competent at the inking and colors. So the inks is, you know, overlaying the pencil work with ink, uh, you know, usually digital, of course. And, uh, you know, for me, it's always digital, but usually digital. Um, and then after that, you know, you're going to have someone who's going to be doing the letters, you know, once you have your pencils, inks, colors down. And, you know, later on, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit about how uh, you know I, I did my own lettering eventually, but it's just something to really <laughs> take seriously. You don't want to be like, oh yeah, let me just try to save some money. Maybe I can find one person to do it all kind of thing. You will more likely than not end up having a, a not as quality product in the end. You know, even though the, uh, the overall design here wasn't too bad considering that you know, the same artist did, in this case, pencils, inks, colors, and letters, uh, you know, the pencils, inks, colors are not too bad. Um, you know, they're pretty competent for the medium and the style. The letters is where he fell short. So, you know, it, it's just something you don't want to to risk. And it's not that bad either. Again, when you have specialization, you have people who are going to be able to maybe charge even a little bit more reasonably because it's just what they do and they're able to pump things out a little bit faster than someone who's not used to doing it all the time, right? You You want someone who because they're more competent, can even be more competitive because it is something that they're they're able to do a bit faster. They have all their templates and their work stuff and they're ready to go on it. So that's one of the first things that I learned in doing my own comic book series to really avoid you know, doing it in the future was not having the same person do letters for everything else. So the second thing that uh, you know was a big mistake that I made from the beginning, uh, sadly, uh, and I didn't realize the value of this until later, was not having, at the onset, character turns for every character. So when I first started doing the series, I just kind of jumped right into it, thinking, oh, okay, well, I'll just have someone design everything ad hoc as we go, right? I'm just going to get someone to start doing pages, and from the pages, we'll develop the character and the continuity which is a terrible idea, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you really want to make sure that when you have your designs, you have a character sheet where you can really see the character drawn from a bunch of different angles. And that way you have a fixed reference for the character going forward. If you don't have a fixed reference, then it's pretty easy to get lost and to have mistakes. And especially for yourself, right? Even if it's not always the artist, sometimes... Uh, you know, yourself, you might catch things and working with new and different people. So you really want to make sure that you do character turns of the major characters before moving forward. And at bare minimum, even if you don't have a bust or something like that, you want to have at least the front, the back, the sides kind of thing, you know, maybe a turned angle. Because if you don't have something like that, again, then it's very difficult for you to catch when there's something off, right? Without, a, without the character being drawn out and detailed in a way that you can know for sure whether something is having continuity, then it's very easy to just miss a little detail here and there. And as you can see here too, uh, with Voluntarius the character, I mean, I've had tons of issues over the years of just, you know, again, not that they made it to final production, but just people doing continuity of the design, you know, whether it's the arm strap being flat at the wrist or how it bends across to the elbow and, and goes behind uh, to the elbow or the V shape on the back or how the belt's designed. If you don't have those elements down solid, 
an artist can do little things like continue the belt too far or have the striping in the wrong place and you might not catch it your eyes might fill it in you're looking at a bunch of stuff and you lose it so you, you know doing character turns of your major characters before you do your actual comic is so incredibly important and i'm kind of impressed at how far i you know i'd gotten without doing it uh, you know, but it didn't come without cost. Like there was definitely mistakes. There was like in certain issues, there's little things off here and there. And that could have been avoided if I just had had from day one, the character turns of the major characters. And I could myself reference those things and just be sure that I have the continuity down. And if I had done that sooner, I probably would have caught a whole lot more uh, things going forward. And, it, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but I did learn <laughs> from the mistake and I had, the, as you can see, I, I eventually got things made and then it allowed me to catch things in the future and be able to do continuity checks much more readily and faster and to show the artist too. That's the other part is you want to be like, oh, hey, here, take a look at that arm or the elbow. This is what you're missing or this is what's off, right? E even the same artist who created it can themselves sometimes have continuity mistakes. Sometimes they just forget or they're working on other projects and they, you know, whatever. So Make sure to do character turns before doing your comic, that is before doing the primary art, or you're going to have a real bad time. By and large, you're just going to, you're going to miss little details. You're going to make mistakes. Either your artist, you know, is going to do something or do something for, a, you know, a special thing. You're working with multiple artists and you have like a little promo art and it's different people and then they make the mistake, whatever it is. So, Blaze says, what's up? Do I have a Discord? I don't have a Discord yet. I've never uh, made Discord, but I've used Discord here and there, but not a, not a big Discord user or guy but maybe i should who knows all right so the third mistake the third mistake i made <laughs> is uh is, is one that is maybe not as obvious uh this one was working with a third party company so some people when they are first starting out doing their own comic book series work uh they are scared and Rightfully so, in some cases, it feels daunting to do it, you know, all alone. And they're like, okay, well, maybe I'll just hire a comic book production company. Now, there are some good ones out there. You know, that it's true. There are some good ones out there that, you know, you, you could actually reasonably rely on and they'll probably be fine. But chances are, and this applies in what from what I've seen to most people, if you're doing Kickstarter or Indiegogo and you're trying to fundraise there's a good chance you don't have the funds to afford the companies that can do things right. Just being real. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're like trying to hire, you know, a, a third party company and you want them to be professional, timely, you know, not jerk you around on different things or try to, you know, say, Oh, you know, like we need to push back the schedule, this or that, or, Oh, could I have some extra money because of this or that? If you want actual good quality professional work, you're paying through the nose. That's just a fact. Now, maybe some people are able to do that. Maybe if you're loaded and you're like, I don't even need a fundraise if I really don't want to, you could afford to do that. You could be like, I'm going to go to a top tier, uh, you know, publishing company kind of thing. And, you know, there are, there are a couple of those, you know, that, that exist, but for most people, they're not looking to spend $600 to a thousand dollars a page. Right. It, you know, if you're paying six hundred dollars, thousand dollars a page, you know that that's what you could be expected to pay if you're saying I'm going to a company that's top tier, right? Where it's like really professional, and that's you know for most people, that's going to put them way out of affordability for making a comic. Um, so the thing is, is that when you work with the lower tier companies you know, you run the risk of having some issues. And I had uh, two different companies that I worked with over the course of time. In the beginning, you know, I was doing things independently, then I switched to companies. So the two companies that I worked with, one ended up having an issue where they tried to say, oh, they couldn't deliver on contract time even after I gave them a two month extension. And then I had to like threaten legal action at that, at that point. Um, and they try to play it off like as if, that's it's no big deal. I'm like, no, you were supposed to deliver. I was generous enough to give you two months extra. And now you got to deliver or there's going to be some problems. So they did deliver. They reprioritized my project because I had a really ironclad contract with them where they'd be a big trouble if they didn't deliver when I said to. Um, so they, they made some moves, but it did also, I think, 
hurt some of their other business relationships because in reprioritizing mine, some of the ones that maybe they had looser terms of agreement, they kind of uh, messed with in their delivery times. And that company went defunct. So their lack of, um, I guess you could say professionalism, I think led to a mass, uh, you could say, annoyance with the company and they went defunct. People didn't want to work with them anymore because they thought they can play around with delivery times with people who had hard delivery dates for people that are on Kickstarter's and Indiegogo. You just can't do that, right? You can't do that. So they went defunct. Then the second company I worked with was really weird. The the company owner was trying to get me to pay more on the contract up front because they had a some you know medical emergency thing. I said no. I said I said if you make a GoFundMe or something like that, I'll you know I'll chip in some money toward it. But it's unprofessional to ask for more of the contract payment you know before it's due because you think you have an emergency. When I'm you know I'm supposed to be making sure I'm a good steward of the backer's money. I'm not just handing over the money. I got to make sure that this money is used appropriately. So that individual, you know, did eventually deliver, but not without even some more stuff of trying to get like extra monies for like PayPal fees and other things. And I said, Hey, we already had a contract about this. What are you trying to get, you know, nickel and dime for extra things that I'm like, our contract solid. It's already set. You should have factored that in when you bid me on the price. So stuff like that. And again, that that's more likely common when you're working with lower tier combo companies, people that are, you know, not the, the not the high end, not the high level professionalism, bigger business. So, you know, I got what I paid for there in a sense. You know, they did do the stuff. They I did get what I paid for ultimately, you know, I because I'm really good at making sure I have good contracts and and that I have everything set and I'm very clear about my expectations. But it left a bad taste in my mouth about working with companies where they handle everything and you're, and you're essentially paying them extra to handle everything. And I thought that it's just ultimately not worth it. And the reason why is just that by and large, you're going to be wanting to have a better relationship anyway, directly with your artists. And if you're the person who's directly dealing with the artists, then you can actually be the front line to making changes and you don't have to go through a middleman person and you can really stay on top of what's going on, right? Instead of having to wait for the middleman and you know this person sends to this person, it's just more streamlined for you to manage the artwork directly. So my you know, third piece of advice there, again, is working with a middleman, a, a middle company, by and large, just not a good idea. You're better off just working with the artist directly unless you're just loaded, you got money to burn, and you're like, yeah, I can afford to pay the top tier company, whatever, $600, $1,000 a page kind of thing. 1000 is a bit high, but more likely around probably around five, 600 I would think, at least for a, a, a high-end company that will deliver, you know, at least you know mid-level comic book work, but it's it's just not gonna um, it's just not gonna fly for most people. You're not gonna you know you mean you're you're not gonna be able to afford it, uh, <laughs> you know at that rate, right? You're thinking like a twenty-four page comic book. If you're paying a company six hundred a page, right? I mean that's already uh, well over twelve thousand dollars, uh, and then six twelve eight twenty-four, right? So that's fourteen thousand four hundred, not including cover, not including anything extra. That's too much for most anybody, you know, doing an Indigo Kickstarter. I would say most people who are, again, if you're for, you're early on, you're in your first couple of, of options and you're just getting out there, will you raise $15,000? Probably not. Most people in their first Indigo Kickstarter are raising under 10,000, which is enough to definitely make your first comic and get people interested because, you know, you're just doing it to friends and and early adopters, that kind of thing. But it's not it's not realistic for most people to raise that level of money that you are going to be able to afford a top tier actual you know comic company that does this type of, of artwork for hire. So again, work with artists directly. You save a little headache. You save a little miscommunication. And you're able to make those corrections much faster if there's any, any, any problems because you're directly communicating with the artist. So definitely something to consider. The third... Uh, <laughs> thing or the fourth thing that i wish i had done a little bit differently is making the perks um that i was you know doing originally things that are relatively easy to ship and are that not that costly so for example and this one's not like the worst of it but i did have a, a sub a sublimination die t-shirts and i had other things too that were a little bit tougher to ship so when you're first doing your your comic project, 
you know, it, it's tempting to want to be like, oh my gosh, I want to have all the cool stuff. I want to have all the merch. I want to have mugs. I want to have figures. I want to have whatever, right? But it's, it's not realistic to be able to do that both well and affordably. You're going to blow most of your budget on these things and on shipping. You, the, really what you should do for most people, again, now this is just more typical, is just look to, to do items that are easy and affordable to ship, lightweight, stuff that will fit with a comic. So we're talking about smaller art prints, you know, under letter size. Um, you know, it could be a patch even. That's, again, that's at least it's a little bit smaller, could fit in there. Uh, stickers, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, game cards even. Anything that can just readily fit into a, a flat mailer that's not expensive to ship. Because if you do more expensive things, again, there's nothing wrong with wanting that or getting to a point where you can reasonably afford to do it. But if you start off with that, you're going to be spending a lot of your fundraising budget on those things. You know, you're not going to be raising as much to actually fund your comic. And there are cool things to have with it. I mean, definitely. It's not it's not like there isn't something ins inspiring to have. You know, like, for example, I have this here, this voluntarist action figure. It it was super cool. It's got 16 points of articulation, Right. I mean, I, you know, it's a super cool prototype thing, but was it worth having made for a thousand dollars? Like it costs a thousand dollars to get two of these. And one of them went to a backer on the campaign. So, you know, on one hand, yeah, this is super cool to have. It's, you know, it's great to be able to like prototype a figure and you can definitely do that off Alibaba or something like that, or even have someone do it 3d printed style, which I've done with those too, but okay, great. Now, out of like the support, I've just spent, you know, five hundred dollars for one perk. Well, that just cut up a huge portion of, you know, your your budget. You know, what I mean, it's like you're you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, have that money go toward the actual comic book creation. Again, super cool, and there is a time and place to do this, but is it? at the beginning or toward the beginning before you've really gotten your, your main story out there and have developed the characters and the character turns and everything. No, it's not a good idea. You're you know what I mean? You're, you're spending your resources on the wrong things. You really need to be spending your resources on the character turns and the actual interior pages and getting your story told and done right. So everything looks good and not on the extras. Again, the extras are cool at the point where you've actually developed the story and you have the characters drawn well and everything's consistent and people are into the universe. But doing that too early means you're spending a lot of money on those designs instead. You're spending, you know, money on the shipment in ways that's, you know, way more expensive and you're taking away from your growth opportunity. You're taking away from actually growing the story that hooks people that gets people want to continue to go along with you. You know, something like this is something to have after you have your like main origins arc done, right? If you if you do this kind of thing, do it after you've already established the character and kind of that background story and have gotten people hooked and you kind of have a little bit of fan base going that actually would want to support you know what you have going forward on a more continual basis. Because otherwise again, you're you're just spending money on not telling the story and it's just on the theoretical future. It's not on the actuality of of getting people hooked into what this character is about and getting them excited and wanting to, you know, be a part of the next issue. So, and it, it, again, th there's lots of fun things you can do. I can even show right here another one of those things. It's, uh, it's a, little, a little embarrassing, but funny at the same time. So, you know what I mean? I did like Zentai costumes too, right? So I had an artist who they specifically do Zentai costumes. That's those kind of Lycra, um, you know, like kind of spandexy suits. It was fun. I did sell a few of, of those, you know, real like big time supporters did get them. They're more expensive to do. They're harder to ship. They were fun. And it's, it's good stuff. It's, it's fun for cosplay. Like if you just want it for your own cosplay fun for promo, you can do that too. But again, when you're spending hundreds of dollars on this right off the bat, instead of developing your story, you're missing out and you're, you're really, you know, hurting your, your ability to actually get the story out there and get the growth going on um, in a way that, is going to get people hooked for the future where they would be willing to be like, oh yes, I really want to get these bigger perks, right? Otherwise, you're just not you're not actually telling the story. And and people are like, okay, that's great. You have a nice figure and a shirt. Okay, but I don't know anything 
you know, much about the character. You only have 10 pages or 20 pages because you spent all your budget, you know, on, on, on the physical perks and not on actually writing the story. So the, uh, the next thing that I did that uh, I'm, you know, there's some pros and cons to it, but I, I at the end of the day, I, I am kind of more on the con side uh, of it. And that is that in the beginning, I had started doing some future verse prototypes. So it's tempting to want to like model and mock up different things that can be happening with the future. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that in terms of saying, oh, I would love to see what it's like if we were like 20 issues out or whatever. But you have to avoid the temptation when it's in lieu of actually telling your story, right? You, you have to avoid the temptation to do that when it's in lieu of actually getting out there the uh, core elements of what it is you want to do. Now, again, were these some fun issues like the voluntary versus state of zombies? Yes, it was fun to do. And it definitely brought in some interest for the series. But it wasn't telling the origin story. It wasn't actually getting readers to the point of being able to connect with the, the the core elements of it. So while these are fun and they were gimmicky and you know insider humor and stuff like that, and you know, and they was prototyping some potentials for the future, ultimately I, it was kind of uh, a deviation from what I should have been doing. And I what I should have been doing is I should have been working on the core origin story and having that chronology move forward. And that's what you should be thinking about with anything uh, that you're that you're working on when you're trying to get your story out there. Is you should be like, okay, is what I'm working on is this actually getting readers the core story and getting them to be like, okay, I want to know what happens next. What's the mystery unfolding? What's actually you know going on? Is it getting them there, or is it just teasing and it's incomplete? Right? It's like, okay, that's a nice tease, but that's incomplete. So again, it, it was fun to do these issues where it's like, you know shielding Assange with the voluntarists and stuff like that. And the artwork was okay. I mean, the colors was probably the best part, but it wasn't really something that was meant to be canon. And I think that in trying to do these future verse things to try to inspire people, I was taking away from the opportunity to just get people hooked on the story. So that is something that I really recommend more than ever, which is that it's easy to get lost in the field of all the possibilities of the things you can do. All the different types, again, the perks and the, the merch and the, ooh, what is future verse stuff, but don't do it. it. It's 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 cool, and there might be a place for it down the road, but when you're first starting, you should be focused on telling the story. You should be focused on keeping it simple with, with the perks that's affordable, and you should be spending the resources that you get on the story development. And that way people are hooked in the story and they want to know what happens next. And then once you start to build up that fan base and that audience from it, then you can start to bring in the more expensive things because the people actually are interested in those things. Now that they're connected with the character. Now that they're interested in what's actually going on with the universe instead of wondering, okay, you know, when are you going to actually like have a, a chronology that's continuous and okay, I can follow this along. So it's, it's something that, is easy to fall into. It's a, it's a trap that I think a lot of people fall into, but you know, it's it's not something that is going to be beneficial long term to your comic book production. In the end, you're going to end up looking back and regretting what you did because you're like, ah, I, I spent too much of my resources on you know the mugs or like trying to make a figure, trying to make you know this T-shirt or whatever, and, you know, and try to like prototype a future verse. And you know, you're gonna be like, ah, I, I, you know, I should have just stayed with the story and, and then built up slowly with everything else. So don't make my mistake of doing that again. Were there some benefits to it? Sure, you know, it was fun to do it, and some people liked the insider humor or content, and some people, you know, did did find it interesting. But as compared to what could be done with actually writing the story and developing it you know, in a continuous chronological manner, it, you know, it, it pales in comparison, right? So if you're, again, it, it, though, if you are going to do just a one-off thing, like let's just say you're not trying to create a story that's supposed to be continuous, like you're doing like a parody issue, uh, like that joke, like the My Hero MAGA whatever thing, the, the you know, like the, I forgot who made it, but it's basically someone did this like Walmite 
a parody with someone could probably tell me what the name of it was i forgot what it's called it's like my, it was my hero parody with trump and it's like a one-off joke okay well yeah if that's your whole thing is you're doing it like a one-off parody joke fine okay you can do your future verse joke kind of thing but if you're like no i'm trying to build an actual continuing universe an expanding universe then no you don't want to be making what the one-off parody thing and and or future verse that doesn't actually tell the story we're going to keep it going and keep people hooked so yeah, it's 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 something to uh, to really not get lost in. It's it's just very easy to get lost in in the weeds of of all the creative possibilities and things you can do. Yeah, as Liberty Privacy here says, voluntary video game, right? I even did prototype uh, a video game at one point, just a simple uh, you know video game with voluntarist, uh, you know, kind of like um you could say one of those like alien space shooters things with voluntarist, where he's like shooting energy at like TSA agents. It was really funny. I did it in a stencil. But again, that's one of those things. You're like, ooh, what else can I do? What else can I do? And you're like losing sight of the fact that you're not actually developing your story. So I definitely got, lo I lost sight several times while developing Voluntarius, just trying to be like, ah, I can do everything. I can show you that we can make all kinds of merch here. See, look, no, it's, it's, it only hurts your progress on moving forward and being able to tell your story and get people hooked on that. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's what people want is the readers, right? If you're a reader and you're like, okay, I want to know what happens next. And the author's like, yeah, but I want to make mugs. <laughs> you know, you're going to be like, bah! you're going to be upset. You're going to be like, why did I do this, right? You're going to be frustrated at yourself because people want to hear the story. Again, the mugs are nice after you've developed the story long enough that someone's like, oh, okay, I'm a fan now. I, I would love to have the mug or whatever. I'd love to have the shirt. I'd love to have the action figure. Yeah, great. There's a time and place for that. I think, you know, even uh, Ethan Van uh, Skyver did that well, right? He, he didn't start off like, here, I'm going to do action figures right off the bat. He started with the comic, and then he worked his way up. After that was successful, he worked his way up to the figures and stuff like that, which makes sense, right? You want to you wanna have the success in the story writing, and that breeds the rest of what it is that you're able to do. Because you know, when you're a creative, it, it's, it's true. It's very easy to get lost in the possibilities that I can do all these different things. I could, you know, and you want to be like, yeah, I, see, I'm, I'm like the big guys, like the big independents. I can, I can do it like them. And it's like, sure, maybe you can, maybe you know how to get this, these things done, but you're losing out. So super galactic, fantastic dimension. Good plug here, actually. I do have that comic. It's in the other room, um, but it's a, it's a really cool uh, superhero genre novel. I definitely recommend. So says here large companies focus on budget slash deadlines which means they're not always getting what you want working with the artist allows for more exploration and creativity if you have a good rapport with the artist exactly right the, you know the law i completely agree large companies that are good again the good part is the predicate not just any company but they're actually are delivering quality artwork on time um you know they may not necessarily even give you what exactly you want you know due to their own constraints potentially of the back and forth and the, and the time, right? So even if they can make some good artwork, are they doing it in the outcome necessarily that you want, right? They're competent in the art, but did they reach the end that you wanted in terms of here's how I want this character posed or this or that? If you work with the artist directly, you save some time there and it's a little bit more convenient to like talk with the artist directly and get them to adjust little things to make it more like what you want than to be like, Okay, I got to go talk to the company again. Oh, this is off. This is off. This is off. Okay, now you're having an email chain back and forth. You're spending all this time, and the company's really, I don't like that. We're going to, you know, whatever charge you for. Whereas if you're with the artist and it's just directly and informal, right? Now there's no longer that intermediate, intermediary uh, charging time. There's not that middleman who's like, oh, well, I'm working, so I need to get paid. Whereas it's like you and the artist, it's like, okay, it's just a casual conversation. It's a little bit easier to directly deal with making those updates or quick changes, especially you're doing the drafts and the pencils. So, and again, if you, as uh, he says here, uh, so uh, yeah, like, I don't, wanna, I don't know if you, what your, your name said, if it's okay, but you know, basically super galactic, fantastic dimension. <laughs> he, uh, he say here that if you have good rapport with the artist, uh, you, you're going to have a much better time, right? And a big part of having good rapport with the artist is always going to be clear communication, you know, clear work product or mock-ups, like whatever you can do to describe it as, as best as possible. Uh, obviously paying on time, being true to your word, uh, that kind of thing, being efficient, you know, those things are going to make it so that you have good rapport with your artist. So absolutely. All right. So let's see here. The, oh, okay. I'm looking at my sheet here. I got a little sheet just reminding myself of what to, uh, of, of these points. So the last part, is uh, not doing my own lettering sooner. 
So when it comes to, you know, the artwork, you know, when you're, you know, thinking about what it is you're going to contribute to or contribute with, I would say by and large, most people who are thinking about making their own comic book series are not primary artists. Yes, there are lots of artists out there who do make their own series and they do do it by hand, uh, but are able to at least do some form of the basics, the fundamentals with pencils or just at least some mock-ups, you know, even if they're rough, just I think like One Punch Man, right? That person who made that series, the original One Punch Man artwork was actually pretty crummy. He, he didn't care though. He's just like, eh, it's about the story. So it was uh, the artwork was like really bad, <laughs> but he didn't care. It's like the story is what matters. And then eventually he found a really talented artist to pick that up and then do One Punch Man really well. So from my experience, most people who are looking to create their own story are not the primary artists. They're, they're people who are the writers, right? That's more often the case. It's pretty rare that someone's just hiring someone to write if, you know what I mean, if you're just doing it on your own. Like the idea of hiring a writer is more like a business corporate thing than, you know, an individual who's just a creator. It's, you know, usually it's like big companies that are like, yeah, we're looking for a writer. So you're mostly seeing people who are writing the story, right? The person who's a creative, they came up with the characters, the powers, the story arc, the mission, the vision, and that kind of thing. Which means that typically those people, myself included here, are not the primary pencilers, anchors, colorists, that kind of thing, or letters. So the question then is, is what, to what extent can you do anything with your comic series yourself in terms of editing and design. And I would say the most common skill, the thing that people can usually do and pick up, no matter who you are, is lettering. Lettering is not necessarily purely easy. It's not like completely easy, but it is something that doesn't require a lot of crazily, you know, honed craft with, with drawing proportions, right? Because it's a little bit more like graphic design, you can pretty much do lettering yourself, you know, picking up, uh, you know, the, the, the basics of Photoshop. You know, you could take just like a basic Photoshop course online, cheap if you've never used it before. And you really should, honestly, if you're going to be doing artwork of this kind, because chances are you're going to need to make adjustments or suggestions. And if you know how to use Photoshop, at least on a somewhat you know, basic to intermediate level, just the basic tools, putting down words, arrows, things like that, you're going to be able to actually communicate with the artist much more clearly and, and show what needs to be changed or maybe change the color on something by just shifting a color slider or stuff like that. So if you want to do your own series and do it affordably, I highly recommend picking up lettering. And lettering is, is something that you can learn you know, in a week pretty much just watching a few videos on the basics of Photoshop. What, you know, there's actually a book that is, uh, is pretty good too. And I'll share a link to that later. I'm going to you know, pull it on up. Um, I'm also going to pull up here uh, a website that can, that can help you out greatly. So there it is. So blambot.com. So the blambot website has a whole guide uh, on how to be a good letter. It's got a bunch of different um, ways that you can learn how to do comic book grammar and tradition in terms of, of design. I take some of these points myself and kind of uh, learn from them and then adapt them to my own style. But it's it's pretty straightforward. It's not it's nothing too hard to pick up. It's something you you can definitely spend. You know, week or if you're very busy, you know, working a job and and doing other stuff, you know, you, you can pick it up over a couple of weeks, just looking at it over a couple of weekends and practicing. So, if you uh, you know do that, if you take a look at blambot.com, look look through their lettering basics, their comic script basics, and stuff like that, you can pretty much pick up how to uh, make a comic book uh, and do some lettering stuff yourself. Now they do have some you know differences from what I like to do. Like for example, in their comic script basics, they have something that's like very formal, where someone's like, "Here's what you need to have for every single panel, and here's what you need to do, you know, for narration stuff." I don't do that. I I do more open ended things because I like my artists to be able to use their creativity to figure out what is the best layout. Uh, like based on their creative inspiration, I just stick to here's what the scene is, here's the description of the characters, and here's the dialogue, and I let them figure it out. But again, if you want to do more, hey, I need to have every panel laid out, you know, they give some templates there too. And then they even have a guide there 
called the uh, Essential Guide to Comic Book Lettering. So the Essential Guide to Comic Book Lettering is something that I'll uh, post a link to later. It's it's basically a book that gives you how you can letter comic books and do it effectively. And it, you know, it goes through everything. So it's it's a book you can pick up and read through if you're genuinely, if you're totally fresh to this. Like this is the, definitely the book you want to get if you're like, I've never done this before. I really want to learn it, nuts and bolts. This is the book to get. It will teach you what you need to know about lettering through and through. I already had some experience with Photoshop, so I didn't come to this totally raw. I, I didn't come to this like not knowing anything whatsoever. Obviously, I know comics generally from just being a comic book fan. So I had a little bit of advantage. But even there, I still read this book, and I found some useful tips and tricks from it. It is based on an Illustrator-oriented workflow, so it's using the Illustrator program. I don't use Illustrator. I use Photoshop, but you can adapt it for either or. It's it's not you know something you couldn't do. So that that is probably the most useful piece of advice that I, I would have given myself going back. I, I genuinely wish I had picked up lettering from the beginning. I should have just done the letters. I should have read and, and learned myself. Now, Blambot didn't have that book out yet with Nate's, you know, Nate's book, but it was in existence and there was enough information to know the basics. Like you could, you know, it's not like, oh, I couldn't have found the basics watching some YouTube videos or something like that. So I, that is my biggest regret. I should have picked up lettering earlier. I would have saved money on hiring a letterer. I would have had another level of checks as I go through everything because, again, when you're proofing your script, you want to make sure everything's spelled right. And also, if you're your own letterer and you're going through it, you're like, oh, actually, you know, I don't like how I wrote this. I want to change it. Well, now you don't have to go and go through a third party or intermediary, stuff like that to get it changed. Now it doesn't matter when you want to do it. If you're reading it, like, oh, you know what? I want to change that. Okay, boom. You just go and change it yourself, right? Now you're going like, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to go in and change that dialogue a little bit or I'm going to adjust what's stated or I'm going to adjust how it's presented. So lettering to me is pretty much the thing to do. Like it's it's the skill that probably most people can pick up because it's more formulaic in a lot of ways. Um, you can be artistic with it. You definitely can be more artsy, but you don't have to. You you can, you know, you can choose to be like, you know, I'm just gonna go with like the most traditional formulaic way of doing it and do fine. You can, you know, go with just the most traditional standard way of lettering and just follow the templates and follow the guide to a T. Um, that's up to you. You know what I mean? It, it's it's something that you have to play around with and see what works best for your style, for what you're making. But it, it's something that if you do pick that up, you're going to really save yourself some headaches uh, because it, it's just a skill that you really can use across the board. It's something that's going to let you be able to communicate um, you know, with your artists. It's going to allow you to make adjustments really quick. It's going to allow you to save some money on lettering. It's going to allow you to adapt to new ideas and new inspirations as you go along with how things are framed or said. So that that's probably the number one thing I would say overall is that if you pick up lettering, you're going to save yourself a ton of, of time, resources, and headaches. And it's again, it's it's not it's not that bad. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh my gosh, I have to draw this from scratch. I have to color this from scratch. No, it's 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 just lettering. You know what I mean? You already wrote the script, right? If you're the writer, you already wrote it. You're just copying and pasting. And then you're just, you know, setting the font style to what you want. And you got Blambot. Again, Blambot you have as a complete guide and, and resource for both fonts. And they have a bunch of free fonts here too. You know, if you want uh, fonts that are free for independent or indie comic use, they have tons of those. You know, they have services, they have guides. You know, there's, there's no lack of any knowledge here. If you go on Blambot, you can definitely pick up at least, uh, you know, the basics, the traditional format of lettering like that. No problem. You know, you'll be on to it and doing it in a few weeks. So it, it's it's just something that you really should consider getting ahead of if you're considering making your comic sued or, you know, are planning out a script and are thinking about maybe next year, you know, getting on that. You, you definitely should pick up the basics of Photoshop and the basics of lettering. And you're going to really set yourself up for success because it's going to let you be able to work with with uh, your artist and to communicate things directly on the work they're doing or to make adjustments and stuff like that. So, says so, Saucier says, I think this is the first time here. Are you comic skate? Yes, I'm definitely in the comic skate realm. In fact, probably one of the earliest because I did voluntarist uh, or I launched it in 2012. Uh, so my stuff 
was was pushing back against the mainstream stuff way before um, it became a really big thing. So, and Patrick said, is there a secret to, to find a good collaborative artist locally? Um, so with me and how I do my artist, I guess you could say procurement, there's a, there's a few ways that you can go about it. So if you're trying to find someone locally, you could, but it's not really advisable necessarily because if you're doing that you're limiting the the options for your talent so you're you're pretty much you know limiting all the possibilities of style because you're not going to probably find like unless you live in a big city where it's like there's tons of people you know you're probably not going to find the diversity of talents you need to like kind of choose and select which style might be best and then your costs might be a bit higher especially if you're in america so, because if you're really just starting out, a lot of times the best thing to do is to hire international. You want to hire from people who are in lower costed areas, which is why a lot of international artists, or as big hubs, are going to be in places where uh, the, it, they're much more affordable because it's just cost of living there is so much different and cheaper. So, a lot of those artists are coming out of you know Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Brazil, Argentina, and stuff like that. Um, you're going to be either in South American or East Asian countries where the cost of living is significantly lower and you, there's much more affordable rates, but they're very competent artists. So, and, and, and for them too, again, it's not like, oh, they're like making nothing. No, it's like the artists live like Kings there. It's like, because, you know, for what they make, they make much more than the average person does over in their country. If they came to America, it would be like, okay, that's not a lot of, as much money. But over in their native country, it's like, yeah, being an artist is like, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing good. So doing international is much more common to do, especially when you're just starting out. Uh, if you do a high-end American artist, your costs are going to be double, triple, maybe even quadruple. So the lettering um, you know, process and stuff like that, uh, you know, that again, you, you can hire out for that. And there's tons of people who do it, you know, even affordably even in the U S because it is relatively a more accessible skill. Um, but lettering by hand these days is almost non-existent. You, you always letter with, with digital because lettering by hand sounds, you know, absolutely miserable <laughs> and insane because, you know, if you just having to fix and adjust things, you know, when you could just have a computer and click a button and boom, you just adjust it. It's, it doesn't make much sense. So yeah, you, you definitely, want to explore the opportunities of of different people from around the world and see you know who's got a good portfolio i could go more into detail on this on another video like in terms of like what to think about and what to look at when you're hiring artists uh, but for a lot of people their first foray into looking at talent um, might typically come from being on deviant art so on deviant art there's a jobs boards forum and it's pretty easy to like post your project and your needs there and to like get a bunch of different offers and people into, and then to actually see what they offer because you can see their accounts, you can see their portfolio there. You can see if they have any other websites or any other demonstrations of the work out elsewhere. It's, it's pretty easy to check out credibility and opportunities there. So, so yeah, so hopefully this helps you think through your own creative process and projects. Uh, you know, again, the things that I, just going through the list again for anybody who's new here. The things that I wish I had done a little bit differently are that I wish I didn't have one artist do it all. I wish I you know broke it up so I had specialization. I wish I did the character turns of the characters early on. So again, I wish I had actually, uh, instead of just going right into the, the comic book production process, I wish I had done more of the turns. Um, I didn't wish <laughs> that I worked with the with the middleman. That is a, a creative agency. I wish I had just worked with the artist directly and continued to do that. I did it from the beginning, but then I shifted away, and that was a mistake. I should have just continued to work with artists directly to save time and resources because it just doesn't make much sense to work with a middle person unless you're just loaded and it doesn't matter. And you're like, yeah, I got the money to throw at this, and I don't want to deal with it, so I'm gonna, you know, pay a crazy amount of money to a big company, whatever. Um, make the fourth making perks that are too costly and too costly to ship. So again, when you're starting out, don't be trying to make action figures. Don't be trying to make mugs and shirts, all this other stuff that you're going to spend so much of your budget on making it and shipping it. Stick to the stuff that's affordable, pictures, art prints that can fit inside, you know, of your comic mail or stickers, that kind of stuff. Again, cool things that people like, but stuff that's not going to be like, oh my gosh, I just blew half my budget on shipping and, you know, and making these perks custom, you know, having an artist custom make, you know, something. Down the road, 
Sure, it makes sense. Absolutely. You know, when you're trying to actually, um, you know, develop beyond just a comic book and make merch and stuff after you have a fandom and stuff like that. But not off the bat and definitely not within the first couple of issues or whatever you finish your first kind of arc. You want to get through your first major arc concept, like a, a major you know, narrative before moving on to bigger things. Cause then people are hooked to the narrative and you've shown that you can do this right and do it well. And now it's like, okay, and now I'm ready to add on cooler things, whatever that may be. Maybe, you know, try out action figures or other more difficult merch items. Then you get, you know, ramped up too in the, in the shipping process and learning about how that works. So, um, not sticking to the chronology right away. Number five, again, so making sure you're telling your story. Don't waste your time trying to do future verse or do one-off teaser weird stuff. Just focus on telling the story. Get your story in there. Get people to get hooked on it and to have the mystery unveiling and to have people like, okay, what happens next? Don't try to be like, oh, here's what happens in issue 50. Here's what happens theoretically, you know, 10 years from now. You're just spinning the wheels and wasting time when you should be telling the story as it's meant to be and to continue, you know, with that, you want to, you want to have the series be continual right off the bat so that people are like, yes, I want to know what happens next, next issue, next, next issue and so on and so forth. And then lastly, of course, again, the lettering, uh, pick up lettering if you can. I mean, if you absolutely can't, whatever, you know, there's letters out there and it's not the most expensive part you know, to do, but if you are able to pick up lettering and teach yourself the basics, you've got two birds, one stone. You have the ability to do the letters yourself and to make adjustments right off the bat, ad hoc, you're good to go. Or number two, you're able to um, actually get the, um, the sorry, just lose my train of thought here because there's some spammer. Um, so you're able to actually get what you need to communicate to the artist more effectively. You're able to, because you're able to use Photoshop, you know, at some basic to intermediate level, if there's anything issue wise with the art or you want to just more quickly show them what detail you want to change. Well, now you're in Photoshop. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Here's an arrow. Here's some text. Hey, artist, could you adjust this in their face? Could you adjust this in the background? You can point to it, put a picture in, describe whatever it's on there. It makes communication way better, much faster. So, so yeah. And, um, Okay, and then Osas says, is there a quick and easy package website that has all issues? Uh, no, there's no uh, package on there because the the comics that I have, and I can show real quick just so people know, the comics here that I have on the website, they're all uh, done through Indie Planet. So they are, it's a third party that does all of the printing and shipping, which that is advisable. You don't want to be the person, like I gotta tell you, that's another... There could be number seven. I didn't have them there, but that's another one. I never did this because I never, I was never going to do it in the first place. But don't think that you should be like, yeah, I'm going to like print and ship all my stuff myself going into the future, at least right off the bat. Again, in the future, yes. And some people even say, well, you'll save so much money and this or that. It's like, no, dude, like if you were just still living your life and you're building this, ramping this up, you want a third party company that is going to handle, you know, all of your. Uh, your your printing and your um, you know fulfillment and stuff like that. You want someone that has the expertise and has the equipment, the facilities, and the, the shipping deals that they you know they can print on demand and they can take care of it. And then you're not there like oh my gosh I got to ship something every day or like oh here's what's coming into this or that. You want to have someone that takes care of that for you. And Indie Planet can blame to me they do that the best. You know it, it's just hard to beat what they have over there going on because. You know, basically, they take care of everything that you could possibly want uh, in terms of hosting and in terms of printing on demand and in terms of, you know, getting stuff shipped out nicely. They're, they're the pros and they're going to make your life so much easier to have everything, you know, listed there and ready to ship. And then you're not being bothered with it. You get your, you know, royalty out of it, you know, for each comic sold, but you're not there having to micromanage all these different shipments. And then it's really inconvenient. You know, what if you're traveling? What if you're doing this or that? You don't have to worry about it. You want to make sure that someone else is taking care of it for you. They have a full-time staff. They're handling customer service. They're handling tracking and sending people the tracking updates. You're you're just free and clear to stay focused on production and creating. And again, if you ramp up to the point where you have the resources, it's like, oh, it makes sense. We have a full-time facility like Eric July did. I mean, that makes sense, right? When you're selling at that scale. When you're just starting out and you're not at that scale yet, okay, no, it doesn't make sense. But if you get to the point where it's like, oh my gosh, 
I'm having thousands and thousands of buyers and it's on a recurring basis. Okay, well, yeah, maybe now it makes sense to get a staff in a warehouse and you do your own mass purchase and your own mass fulfillment. But even then, you know, it depends on your risk. It depends on your time commitments and what you really want to do, you know, how much of your time you want spent, you know, doing those types of just daily chores rather than, oh, okay, I'm just focused on making the campaigns. I'm focused on making the story. I'm focused on working with the artists and getting stuff done. That's what I want to be doing with my time. You know, as much as I, I do enjoy the fulfillment after a campaign, I'm like, it feels great to send people personal notes and to fulfill it. If that was to the point of like, oh my gosh, this is all the time. Yeah, no, I don't really want to be like, okay, I'm the one who has to like sit here and fulfill all these packages every day and ship them out manually, you know, and stuff like that, as opposed to, okay, actually my time is spent working on the comic uh, script, working on the actual uh, artwork being formatted, making sure everything's good. That's what I'd want to be focused on is, is on the creative side. I think that probably applies to most people who are actually the writers, producers wanting to make this happen. You, you know, you're not wanting to like be bogged down in the the day to day grind of fulfillment. So, all right. Well, I appreciate everybody here hanging out. It was really great to uh, to see everyone. Thanks, uh, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Sauce. Thanks, C four C. Big big special thank you to Super Galactic Fantastic Dimension. <laughs> Jeremy, there was really appreciate that uh, super chat. That's awesome. And definitely check out his series too, the Super Galactic Fantastic Dimension. I'm actually going to be promoting it uh, when they have a uh, a launch of their next issue. So I have their original one. And actually, maybe I should do a review of that too at some point, going through the, the, the basics of that that comic book. So, well, I mean, it's really like a graphic novel of how thick it is, uh, but, you know, it's a comic. So definitely something to check out. Um, good to see Nathan. Good to see LP. Good to see Gary. So, oh, good to see uh, 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 Mohammed and blaze and everybody so thank you so much for hanging on out and we're gonna just keep on uh, having fun watching this culture change it's it's always fun every day to continue to see the indies start to win and to start to uh you know get people to gravitate away from the mainstream woke SJW nonsense and to be like okay i'm ready for some meat i'm ready for some real action and adventure and character development and intriguing plots that really make you think you know I definitely crave that. And even back then in 2012, when I finally launched Voluntarius, I'm like, I'm tired of this stuff in the mainstream. It's like they all just, you know, hate liberty and they hate, you know, individual freedom. And everything's always about, you know, we need to have eco-fascism and, you know, government good. So, all right. Take care, everybody. And I'll see you later. Zero State with Jack Lloyd.